Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's probably not the idea of a good time on a Friday afternoon is to talk about tax planning, but yet here we are. So we really appreciate your time uh, to come and go through what we've put together as a bit of a webinar on what we think are the important things to think about in this tax planning and end of financial year season. Um, what makes it a little bit more important is I guess the impact of COVID-19 um, and the th different sorts of things that we received, different cash flow position to what you might have had last year and a whole bunch of other things. So what I'm gonna do is make the four of us um, quite small. Now I'm Sally Preston, I've got David McLeod, Jeff Arnold and Kerry Bevendorf on the um, panel today who are all gonna talk about different aspects of tax planning for both you and your business. Um, I'll put the slideshow up. You should have received it in advance, but we will send it out to you again. Now we have a lot of content we wanna go through today. So please feel free to throw questions up into the chat box, but please understand that we may not be able to get to them today, but we hope that you'll get to make contact with your More Stevens advisor in the next few days or in the next week to talk about your tax planning and how we can help. And they will certainly be able to go through any questions that we've sort of left um, untouched for you. Now, tax planning is one of those things that's very specific to your business and your own personal circumstances. So this is just general information. And of course, you do need to get specialised assistance and advice on all the things that we talk about today. That's my general disclaimer. It's on your slides. Um, this is not advice for you. This is general information. And I'm really thrilled um, that you were here to go through some of this stuff. So. I am not an IT person. So if this all goes pear-shaped, you're gonna have to forgive me, all right? Now, the guys that are here are gonna jump over the top of each other. We're gonna have a chat. We wanna make it um, as not tax nerdy as I possibly can, being a tax director. Um, I've even told David that superannuation does not excite everybody, so just calm down. Um, I've told Jeff that not everyone loves cows. And, uh, and Kerry's your general accountant, which means she's not a good time in a room. So we'll do our best to give you a bit of a giggle and make it interactive, but make sure you ask your question. The outline of the session is we are gonna go through the impact of the coronavirus. We're gonna talk a bit about companies and tax planning. We've got trusts, individuals. Um, David's gonna talk about superannuation. Um, Jeff's gonna talk about um, tax planning for primary producers. And we've got some other uh, tips at the end that we'll go back through. Please move on. Okay. So COVID-19 impact on this year's tax planning. So there's been two major things we've already done webinars on. Um, one of those is um, on the cash flow boost, you've hopefully been eligible and received a nice little cash flow boost towards your um, payment of wages, basically. Uh, pay, payment of pay as you go withholding by the, um, the ATO. And the other one is the JobKeeper payment. Now, we're not gonna go in detail about those. The main thing is that it will have an impact on this year end tax planning. So the cash flow boost is actually non-assessable, non-exempt income. So what that means is you're not gonna be paying tax on the amount you've received. Well, this actually has an impact on your tax planning. So it sounds great to get tax-free money and we're all thrilled to have it. Um, and it has an impact depending on the structure you've got. So if you're running yourself, uh, running your business through a company, one of the impacts is that it's gonna leave insufficient franking credits potentially for when a dividend is paid. So if you're not paying company tax on amount of income, that income's gonna go into retained earnings. When a dividend's declared, there's not necessarily gonna be enough franking credits to actually frank that dividend. And so what that means is when the dividend comes out, say to an individual or another entity that needs to pay tax, they're likely to have to pay the full top up tax, okay? So the tax comes home later. So while we can say it's not taxable, but the chances are in a, in a, well, in a company, it will 
potentially come home later where there is some tax or some shortfall franking credits. In a unit trust, if you, if you are operating a unit trust, you may have heard um, your advisor talking about CGT event E4. Uh, that's not actually going to be included when we make that assessment of whether a CGT event E4, and that's got a bit too technical. I'm sorry, I'll pull back out of that. But that's just something to make note of. And then in a discretionary trust, if the amount is distributed to a corporate beneficiary, you're actually going to be in the same boat. So if you send the, the profit that represents um, or the accounting profit that represents that um, cash flow boost to a corporate beneficiary, again, you're going to end up with insufficient franking credits um, because the company will also potentially treat that as non-accessible, non-exempt income. Partnership, it'll come out tax-free to the partners because they will treat it that way. Um, and if you're a sole trader, well, it's not accessible, not exempt in your name, so you're okay. So there's a few things there to think about with that cash flow boost and a little bit of planning to go around it. Now, JobKeeper's the other one that a lot of people, we've done a lot of work with, um, with our clients um, on JobKeeper. And I'm not going to go through JobKeeper today. We're going to talk instead and about how you're going to record the receipt of JobKeeper payments. They are accessible income. So they will be an income item in your profit and loss. What you'll then have is in some cases, if you're topping up employees, you'll have a wage expense to offset that amount. But if you're already paying your employees amount um, of wages and job keepers essentially kept by the business, then there is going to be um, tax to pay on that because there's no corresponding expense to offset it. Um, what that means is, um, I'll, I will mention a, a eligible business participants in a minute. Um, but there, so in a company situation, it will be taxable and that's, that's going to give you, um, uh, potentially an extra bit to, that you need to set aside from the amounts that you receive to put that, to pay for that tax. Now, if you put an eligible business participant, and now if you remember to our earlier webinars, they're the, they're the owners of the business that are actively operating the business and, and most of the structures are allowed to have one. They, those amounts aren't required to go to that person, unlike an employee's amounts that must be at least paid the $1,500 a fortnight. An eligible business participant does not have to receive it. It can be kept in the entity. So if you're running a company, the issue that you have is how do you get that money out of the company if you want it? So if you want to take out that money uh, and you're a director of the company, we've got a couple of things to think about. One is the director's fees. Now, in prior years, director's fees, and I'll talk a little bit about this, um, were basically just put through as an expense and paid to the director. The ATO is now saying that unless those director's fees uh, pay as you go withholding and super paid on them, they're not going to be deductible. So how do you then get that $1,500 a fortnight out of the company? It might be borrowed or it might come out as a dividend. Uh, if you're running a trust, expect that that amount will come out as a distribution uh, and where that goes depends on the structure that you've got. If you're running the business um, through a partnership, it, can, it will go out potentially as a partner distribution and that would depending on the agreements in place, it might go to all partners in proportion. There's a couple of other things that um, you may have received. You may have received the apprentices and trainees payments. So that is a wage subsidy. Again, that's going to be income. Now, I'm not going to talk about grants if you've received grants because they're all a little bit different, but you definitely need to see your advisor about whether those grants are going to be accessible income. Okay, the other... The other um, tax concession, we'll call it, that was announced is this instant asset write-off. So instant asset write-off has been available across a number of years and every year we're told it's the last year and it's going back to being $1,000. Now, this instant asset write-off is available. Generally, it was available for much smaller businesses and during this period or for this remaining part of this financial year, they've increased the businesses eligible to take it to being uh, turnover of less than 500 million rather than 50. Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on that. I just want to talk about the tax planning points. 
that instant asset um, threshold has increased to 150,000. So whilst we only have four weeks left or a month left in this financial year, so long as that asset is purchased and installed and ready for use. So if it's sitting on a ship, still arriving, it's not going to be eligible for this concession. Okay, it'll, it'll actually be picked up in the next one we'll talk about, which is accelerated depreciation. So the tax planning ideas we've got, if you were going to buy an asset one July and you know you, you could actually get it now and install it and have it ready to go, go out and get it as is it, is an idea if your cash flow is sitting there anyway. Um, and also, if you've historically had a small business pool because you've been in a small business depreciation, your pool balance is going to be written off if it was less than 150000 at 1 July or at 30 June last year. So that's something to note. And I think, Jeff, you want to just talk about how that might affect the primary producers. Yes, Sally, I think this is going to be a real uh, sleeper for, for clients. Um, when I'm talking to, to them about tax planning or what they're looking at doing between now and the end of June, a lot of people have heard through the media about that 150,000 uh, limit, but, but the misconception is if I'm not going to be purchasing any equipment up to that value, it doesn't affect me. Whereas, as you've said, if that pool balance is less than 150 and uh, at, at the 30th of June, that whole depreciation gets wiped out. I'll, I'll talk a little bit further uh, in my section about what that means for tax planning, but, but ultimately there's, there's two, two hits that, that's going to come. Firstly, going forward, because your depreciation is going to be uh, cleaned out. Um, and secondly, can we make use of that depreciation that, that's going to fall in this year? So I suppose the takeaway from my perspective is have a look at your financial statements, call your accountant about what your balance or remaining balance is. Um, are you going to be one of those businesses affected where your depreciation will effectively be cleaned out in one fell swoop? Thanks, Jeff. Good points. Now, I'm not going to go through this table. It is in your slide pack. This is just telling you where all the different dates and the instant asset write-off threshold sit. So you can refer to that um, when you catch Sally, up. With the tax plan. Said, sorry, one more thing too. I, yep. I get a lot of clients saying to me, what's going to happen after the 30th of June? And that is on the back of, um, as, as uh, clients may know, over the last few years, it's always been well. We're going. We're we're, in, we're extending this twenty thousand limit for another twelve months. We're going to make it twenty five. Now we're going to make it thirty. Uh, the government has always said at this point in time, well, it's only up to the thirtieth of June. They end up extending it. Um, it's it's worth noting, um, as per the table of Sally's here, that if nothing happens and there's no further announcements, uh, this is where uh, the party stops. And after the first of or thirtieth of June. Uh, technically, it will drop back to $1,000 for the write-off. Yeah, that could hurt some people that have started to rely on it, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, the other one that's um, a COVID special is accelerated depreciation deductions. So what we've been given is if your asset that you're buying is above that $150,000 amount or it's not ready to go for 30 June this year, this concession is going to keep running a bit longer. So it's basically a 50% upfront deduction and then normal depreciation after that. So definitely if asset purchasing is where you're sitting at the end of this financial year, then you've got two options to consider um, in, in, off the back of that. Now that is only going until 30 June 2021 and then we'll be back to our normal small business um, depreciation. Uh, just also know this accelerated depreciation deduction though doesn't apply to second hand assets this is for only new assets so i think that that's important to note the instant asset write-off is for new and second hand all right that's our short snip on those covid concessions i'll call them companies so if you're running your operations or you have a company, you will have heard about this probably every year from your accountant if you've borrowed money from that company and it's Division 7A. Division 7A requires um, complying loan agreements to be put in place and the rules, um, you know, you don't have a seven-year term or there's a whole bunch of rules around it. We're not going to run through that today because you've probably heard it 
um, at every tax planning period. What we want to talk about is what's different this year. So what's different is the ATO came in and gave everybody a blanket deferral from being tax returns due 15 May, and they gave us till the 5th of June. Now, normally when they give a deferral, the rules around Division 7A say that it, it's the due date of lodgement is when your Division 7A compliance needs to be in place. And if you've got a deferral, normally it's still the due date of lodgement originally, not your deferred date because that's special to you. The ATO has confirmed this year that they have given us to the 5th of June for Division 7A compliance to go with that blanket deferral because instead of saying it's a special deferral for you, they've said everybody gets it, so therefore we've pushed that compliance deadline. Um, and of course, that's next week. There is some deferrals um, for clients at the moment, so please talk to your advisor if you did have a return due about what that new due date might look like. But that's all I really wanted to say um, about on Division 7A today. A big one. A big one for companies is that, and it's slipped under the radar a bit, there is another company, or small, we'll call it the small company, um, tax rate drop due for 1 July. Uh, so that's a drop down to 26% from the, the current 27.5%. And we that's for what we call base rate enti entities, which is basically if your company has an aggregated turnover of less than 50 million and it's got a, a certain, it passes a passive um, income test. So unfortunately, when we do these changes of company tax rates, there's a little bit of um, potential franking credits being trapped. So what happens is if you declare a dividend next year, you basically frank it to that percentage based on this year's attributes. It's quite confusing. But if you're franking your dividend at 26% last year based on profits paid this year, tax at 27.5%, you've got a 1.5% excess franking credits or tax you pay that you don't get to hand through to your shareholders. And that's what we call trapped franking credits. And that happened when we dropped the 27, when we've dropped our tax rates, when we started moving down from the 30%. Um, that's potentially an impact, but if you've now all of a sudden got excess franking credits and you've got the cash flow boost, it actually might marry up and you might actually be okay from both because those excess franking credits might end up being an advantage to you when you've got non-assessable, non-exempt income coming out. So there's a little bit of um, jigging around to make a decision about whether you should pay a dividend uh, this year when you're paying tax at 27.5% and you can frank it at 27.5% or whether you should pay tax at 27.5% and only frank the dividend to 26%. Again, I know it's confusing, but I just want to draw that, um, I guess, onto your radar so that you can have that discussion if you're in that base rate entity. And it is a bit of tax planning. Now, a couple of planning points, and this is, is important. So the question is, when do you pay the dividend? Now, with the, the, the COVID-19 impact that it's had on some businesses, or a lot of businesses, cash flow might be the problem. Okay, so unfortunately, if the cash isn't there, it's really difficult to pay a dividend. You've got to be mindful also of Corporations Act and the ability to pay a dividend when you look at your balance sheet. So that's another thing. Um, I talked about the impact of cash flow boost that might actually let you recover some of those trapped um, franking credits. You've also got to think when you pay a dividend, and hopefully you might know all of the shareholders of the company, but you also might not know all of their... Um, their tax attributes and their tax planning. So before um, before you go paying a dividend, you might want to check with your shareholders they actually want one this year, not next year, or vice versa. Uh, you also need to be mindful that when your income goes back up above that uh, base rate entity threshold, so that's 50 million, you jump back into the normal company tax rate of 30%. And so the effect of having franking credits trapped essentially gets reversed if you are growing and you're going to go back up to the normal company tax rate. So the trap franking credits aren't a long-term thing. Um, the trap franking credits uh, can also, I think I might talk about it later, but they can also be used in, in other areas. So the non-assessable, non-exempt income is a big one. The best news is we do it all again in 2022 when the tax rate drops again. 
So keep that in the back of mind. This is not the only tax rate they've promised. Having said that, we'll wait and see what comes through in budgets because that might not stick. But at the moment, a future tax rate reduction is due in 2022 for companies, for these companies. All right, so there's a couple of other things and it's still COVID related and it's gonna keep drawing back to COVID because that's, the, not, that's the, um, the hot topic this year and, and the biggest impact that we're seeing on what's changing your tax planning. So that we also had the ability to actually reduce um, or, or reduce our instalment rate for companies if cash flow was tight and even get a refund of pay-as-you-go instalments that had already been made. Now, if you've gone and done that, You've got to have, be mindful with your advisor. You need to look at your franking account balance by 30 June. Because what it might mean is if you've stripped out, say you paid a dividend on the 10th of July last year, okay, relying on the fact that you're going to make income tax instalments paid and therefore the franking credits would be there to not put your franking, credit, uh, franking account in deficit. So if you've now got a refund of those instalments or you've varied your rate and you haven't made those tax payments, you could end up with a problem with your franking account where it's gone below zero. We call that a franking account deficit. So if it is in deficit, you do need to do a couple of things. One is you need to lodge a franking account return by the end of July. So this is a very timely thing to check on. A, you've got time to relook at it before 30 June and figure out if there is a problem. And B, you've got till 31 July um, to fix the problem if it's still there at 30 June. So you, could, you also have to pay franking deficits tax. Now the ATO has come out, and not, well, normally what would happen is um, you would get a penalty for having a negative franking account. And the ATO has come out and said, there's no penalty for over franking if it's due to dividends paid before one March. So those dividends you paid back in July, if you then peel back your instalments, you, being negative is still an issue and you will have to catch up the shortfall by 31 July, but they're not going to penalise you, provided they weren't dividends you've paid since 1 March. So if you turn around now and push your franking account deficit, you won't get the concession on the penalties. But if you, it was earlier, um, the ATO has said that they won't apply it. Okay, the other tax planning points, if you were in a company. Um, just say it's been a tough year. It's been a tough year for a lot of people. Uh, Continuity of ownership test and similar business tests are two tests that we use to see if we can access losses, tax losses. So if your company has generated tax losses this year, before you can access those losses to hopefully generate income next year, you have to apply one of these two tests and pass it. Now, I want you to have a think about if you are in losses this year, about what you're planning to do in the next few years when you want to try and recoup these losses and offset your income. One of them is if you all of a sudden want to bring an external investor in. So you want someone to come in and take 51% of your company to help stimulate, do something different, then all of a sudden you're going to fail continuity of ownership test. And those losses will be relying on similar business test. Well, let's add on, to, on top of that, that you've got an external investor and now you've started doing business a completely different way those losses may now not be available. So it's definitely worth thinking about what you're doing, particularly if you do have these losses sitting there um, in the future to make sure that they are still accessible if you change your business um, and change your ownership structure. Um, other things to consider, I mentioned it before, the remuneration of business owners. Because the ATO did say that from this financial year, they will not allow you to deduct director's fees unless you make them a complying payment. And the complying payment is pay as you go withholding like an employee and um, superannuation. So basically, um, if you are in a habit of paying director's fees at year end, you really need to have a look at that for this year. Um, and R&D activities. I think Kerry's going to talk about that at the very end, but R&D is something to consider. Um, and have you undertaken eligible R&D activities? So trust tax planning, I'll keep moving through this. Um, if you've got a trust, you've been told by your more Stevens advisor, you must do your minutes before the end of financial year. Hopefully they're done um, and they'll be, or they'll be done with your tax planning and they'll be signed and they'll be ready to go. You also need to make some decisions about your trust. Is it time to set up a, what we call a corporate beneficiary? That's basically a company 
which receives some of the profits from the trust. Um, why would we do that? We would do that if there's income that you don't necessarily need um, in your own personal name this year, and we might send it to a corporate beneficiary to take advantage of the company tax rate. Um, examine unpaid present entitlements uh, and trust distributions for potential Division 7A. But the one I wanted to mention was Section 100A, and this might be new. It's otherwise also known as a reimbursement agreement, and it's been a bit of a sleeper until the last few years with the ATO. What this rule says is that where you've got an amount of money that you're sending to somebody and um, you aren't, you're not actually sending them the money, you've got a distribution of profit to go to them, but they're actually not going to be the beneficiary of the money. Um, they, might, they call that a reimbursement agreement. Now, there's exclusions under these rules that say where you make a transaction like that because of ordinary family dealings, they're exempt from these rules. And until now, that, that would mean, for example, you can make a trust distribution to your two adult children um, and they use their marginal tax rates to determine their tax bill on it. Now, in some cases, that money might come straight back to... Um, might stay in the trust, it might go to mum and dad and, and not actually make its way to the kids. What 100A, and the ATO is normally said that's an ordinary family dealing, they're now saying, no, that's not how a family would normally operate. We're waiting on their actual guidance, but they are targeting these sorts of transactions. So what that means is we need to be more mindful when we make a trust distribution to make sure the cash goes to the person who we've said is going to get the benefit from the money. Now, it's not it's not a fail-safe plan, but at the moment, if those children are being used to distribute to um, from the trust's bank account, send it to the kids' bank account. That would be um, the best thing. And that way, the kids actually are getting the money. Um, and, but your advisor will talk about that in more detail because I don't really um, want to fall into the trap of talking about it. <laughs> too much <laughs> so I want you to be aware of it I want you to talk to your advisor and say what should I be doing differently if I want to be conscious of these rules and given we haven't seen the ATO ad advice yet okay all right I'm going to hand it to Kerry because you've had enough of me just unmute myself mm -hmm. good afternoon everybody thanks Sally um, I'm just going to pretty much do the same that Sally did and stick to the, the tax planning measures that maybe um, were affected by COVID this year. So the first thing up is rental properties. We've had a lot of queries in this regard. So for those of you who own rental property, properties during the COVID-19 period, um, if your tenants are not paying full rent or may have temporarily stopped paying rent, because their income was adversely affected by COVID, you might, have, you might have some questions about how deductible your expenses may be. So if you're in this situation and you keep, um, you're still incurring your normal expenses on your property, you'll still be able to claim these expenses as a deduction in your tax return. Uh, similarly, if the bank defers your loan repayments for a period of time as a result of COVID and if interest continues to accumulate, this, this will be an expense that's obviously incurred and it's deductible also. Um, if you receive a back payment of rent from, uh, you know, your, your tenant might um, say, here's your rent that I owe you or an amount of insurance for lost rent, that, that amount will need to be included in your income tax return as assessable in the financial year that you receive that money. With um, short-term rentals, these probably have been adversely affected due to COVID restrictions on travel, including some cancellation of existing bookings. So if you've had previously had some private use of the property and deducted your expenses in proportion to your private use, the amount you can claim in you as a deduction will depend on how the property was used before COVID and how you plan to use it during the COVID period. So if for the reason, um, 
If the reason for the adverse effect on, on demand of your property is because of COVID or the bushfires before this, you can keep deducting expenses associated with your property in the same proportion as you were entitled to deduct before COVID. But if you've um, had some changes, for example, if you've increased the private use of the property um, during COVID, or decided that, you know, I'm just not gonna rent it out again once the COVID restrictions end, we're just gonna use it as our private um, property, then just speak to your more Stevens advisors regarding your own personal circumstance. Um, some of you may have stopped even paying for advertising during the holiday, during the COVID period, given that no one's traveling, no point to advertise. Usually you're not eligible for deductions for a property unless you've made genuine efforts to ensure the property is available for rent. So the deduct deductibility of your expenses during the time will depend on a much wider range of factors. So whether genuine efforts are made to ensure your property is available for rent is only one factor to determine how to apportion your deductions. Um, but you'll also need to consider how your property was used before and um, during the period of COVID. I think the ATO may consider it reasonable to temporarily reduce the level of paid advertising because no one's traveling. If your property is say on the Gold Coast or somewhere that has largely been affected by COVID. Um, you know, you, you won't be able to, if you say, oh, we've used our holiday home to isolate our family during COVID, as I believe some politicians politicians may have done. Um, in this case, you won't be able to claim deductions during the period for your property. So that's all I've got to say about rentals. If we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Sally. Um, home office expenses. Now, normally when a portion of your home is used for work-related or business activities, um, deductions may be available for a portion of your occupancy expenses, such as mortgage, interest, um, rent, council rates, building insurance, but only where your home is your principal place of, of business. And to be your principal place of business, you run your business from home and you have a, a separate business area, a set aside, a separate area exclusively for business activities. There may be, just as one point, there may be capital gains tax implications on selling um, when you do claim such expenses. So I'd urge you to speak to your more Stevens advisor for further advice in this regard. However, you can also claim running expenses such as electricity, cleaning, wear and tear of office equipment and furniture, whether or not your home is qualifies as a place of business. Usually you can only claim a, a deduction where the expense has a sufficient connection with your income earning activity. So due to COVID, of course, there have been more people than ever working from home and incurring additional running expenses. So the ATO has recently re released a new simplified method to claim your additional running expenses um, while you've been working from home. This method can only be used during the period 1 March to 30th of June 2020. So the, the period may be extended down the track, but for now it's, it just applies until 30th of June. So under these new temporary simplified, under this new temporary simplified method, individuals can claim a deduction for all of their running expenses incurred between 1st of March and 30th of June based on a rate of 80 cents per hour that an individual carries out genuine employment activities or runs their business from home. This rate, however, covers everything. So it's your decline in value of, and repair of home office furniture, phone and internet expenses, stationery, computer, consumables, everything. Um, to use this 80 cents per hour method, you don't need a dedicated work area. However, you must keep a record of the number of hours you've worked from home through timesheets, diary, some other form of documentation. Now, you don't have to, you're not obligated to use this simplified method and you still have the option of claiming additional running expenses during this period under the existing method, which is 52 cents per hour for your utilities and depreciation of office furniture and the actual method which means you have to look at your separate running costs and calculate them and substantiate them. 
So we would, I guess what we're doing is cautioning our clients not just to rely on the 80 cents per hour method as that might not maximize their deduction. So if we can go to the next slide, Sally, we've got a bit of an example here. So let's say um, Susan is an employee who works from home full time during the COVID period from shutdown on the 23rd of March to the 30th of June. Now she, to be able to work from home, she buys a new computer monitor costing $180. She's um, substantiated that she has 80% work related use of that. She buys additional printer cartridges, uh, a new office chair costing 200. She also incurs additional electricity costs and uses her personal internet connection and she's um, estimated or documented 60% work use during that period. So her hours working from home during that period were 525 hours. If, you, if she resorts to the simplified method, she will have a tax deduction to claim of $420, which is 80 cents multiplied by the 525 hours. And that's the extent of her deduction. If, however, she uses the 52 cent per hour method combined with the actual method for her other expenses, she can claim, um, as is set out there, she can claim $273 for the um, utilities, et cetera, but then she can, she can claim immediate, immediate deduction for 80% of her computer screen, the additional printer cartridge costs, 60% of her home internet use during that period. So that gives her a deduction of $675. So in that circumstance, Susan achieves a better outcome with the current, the, the current rules. Um, we recommend, I guess, during this time, just keep all your receipts and a diary record of your hours worked. So then when, you, when 2020 tax time comes around, when you're preparing your return with your accountant, um, we'll have the option of claiming either method. That's all I have to say about that. Jerry, can I just add to that, uh, sure, please? Yeah. The, uh, with the spotlight on working from home and so many people changing to, to that uh, system, it's going to be an area I think that the ATO are really looking closely at. And it yep. unfortunately is an area too where as, as accountants, we hear um, uh, my mate said, and, and my mate said you can claim this, and my mate said you can claim that. And, and there's a whole raft of, of things that are incorrectly getting spread around both in tea rooms, in coffee rooms, and over the internet about claiming everything from, from um, uh, loan repayments for mortgages to, uh, uh, additional car claims, uh, buying rugs for the for the house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So just be careful that a you're getting the right advice, and b that that um, you do review those uh, expenses carefully because it's something that the ATO would be crazy not to have a close look at going forward. Yeah, and we anticipate that they definitely will for that. Thanks for that, Jeff. So now we just move on to foreign residents and the main residents exemption if I can get my notes up um, I just wanted to touch briefly it's not COVID related however um, the law changed on the 12th of December 2019 with regard to capital gains for those who might become foreign residents for tax purposes in the future so previously you could become a foreign resident and your Australian principal place of residence so your home would be remain capital gains tax exempt for a period of up to six years. Um, that's the simplified version. Under the new law, foreign residents for tax purposes can only claim the capital gains tax um, main residence exemption for dis dis disposals that occur until 30th of June 2020. That's for a property that was held prior to the 9th of May 2017. Or if you acquired your your home um, after 9th of May 2017, the main residence exemption already doesn't apply. So in both of those circumstances, you'll only be able to apply for exemption from capital gains tax on disposal of your home if you move overseas, if you satisfy the life events test. And that um, the life events test is that at the time of disposal, of your property in Australia, you had been a foreign resident for six years, six years or less, 
and one of the following must have occurred. So you, your spouse or your child under 18 had a terminal medical condition. Your spouse or child under 18 had passed away. The capital gains tax event involved the distribution of assets between you and your spouse as a result of your divorce, separation or similar maintenance agreements. So it's worthy to note that this change only applies if you are not an Australian resident for tax purposes at the time of disposal. Be mindful that if you dispose of the main residence under, under a contract, the disposal time is the date or the time and date entered into the contract. And if you don't dispose under a contract, say if it's a transfer to a family member or something, the disposal time is the time of settlement. Where you are a foreign resident for tax purposes when you pass away, the changes I've mentioned also apply to your legal, personal representatives, trustees, beneficiaries of your estate, surviving joint tenants and special disability trusts. So that's all I want to really say about that today, unless um, any of you guys have any questions. If not, I'll hand back to you, Sally. Thanks, Kerry. Look, we're going to move on to superannuation. I'm conscious of time too. So, um, David, are you, can you make me understand no. superannuation? That would be great. I'll try. I'll try <laughs> very hard. So, there's a couple of areas I just want to um, cover off this afternoon. So, one is the basic what the contribution limits are. So, people don't put in more super than they um, than is allowed and get taxed extra. Um, the next one is the concessional contribution catch up, which came in. Um, well, this is the first year they can really use it. Um, it started from the 1st of July 18, but the 2020 year is the first year you can actually catch up on concessional contributions that you fell short in the 19th financial year. Uh, after that, just the, the COVID early release um, that a lot of people have already started to um, apply for and get access to. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about um, people who are on pensions, um, paying the minimum pension, and there's been some changes due to um, the COVID-19 in that area as well. So I'll just start with the contribution limits quickly. So I talk about concessional and non-concessional contributions. So what they basically are is a concessional contribution is a deductible contribution. So that could be your SG contributions, employer contributions, for example, or it could be a personal deduction that you're paying for that contribution. Uh, non-concessional contributions are typically money that's post-tax dollars that go into the fund that nobody's claim a tax deduction for. Um, so that's tax-free going into the fund, so the fund doesn't pay any tax on those either. So um, the, basically the contribution limits haven't changed for the last few years. Um, $25,000 is the deductible contribution limit and $100,000 is the non-concessional contribution limit or undeducted contribution limit. Um, for those who are over 65, to be able to make a contribution, they have to meet what's called a work test, which is working 40 hours in a 30 consecutive day period um, in the year that you make the contribution. And it has to be for gainful employment, so it can't be charity work, for example. Um, thanks, Ali. So one of the main things for contributions is the timing of it. So the contribution counts in the year that the fund actually receives the contribution itself. So what a lot of people do is they realize that all of a sudden it's 30 June, and they go into the bank account and make a, an EFT transfer into the fund. Um, if they've got a self-managed super fund, quite often the fund, if a fund receives that on the 1st of July or the 2nd of July, it's counted in that financial year, not the year that you actually, you know, did the transfer on your, on your computer. Um, the other thing is clearing houses. It's when the fund receives it, not when the clearing house receives the contribution. So just be aware of there may be some delays with clearing houses leading up to the end of the year. Um, Another one of the big tips is if you've got your own self managed super fund and you, you operate your own business, um, you can actually pay the contribution in, in as a check, which is very old school, but it still actually works because the contribution is actually received by the trustee, being yourself, um, when you receive the check. So you pass it from one hand to the other. As a trustee, you've then received the check, therefore the contribution is being received in that financial year. Um, you just got to make sure you bank the check within a reasonable, reasonable uh, limit. So you can't take two months to bank the check. You have to do it probably within a week of the end of the financial year. So David, you're trying to tell me there's still checkbooks? I think so. <laughs> I think mythical creatures out there called checkbooks. I know. <laughs> um, 
So the planning ideas is obviously timing is important with these things. The second planning idea is that the, you can make personal deductible contributions to a super fund, even if you're receiving employer contributions. So I've got an example where, say you got Toby who works for Sorkin Proprietary Limited. So he's a salaried employee. He receives $8,000 a year in SG contributions. What he could possibly do if he's got the cash is about to make a $17,000 contribution to the super fund and claim that as a personal tax deduction in his own return. Um, one of the catches is you have to actually notify the super fund that you've actually made a deductible contribution to it so they don't count it as a non-concessional contribution. But it's one of those things that it came in a few years ago, but I don't, I think it's one of those things that gets forgotten about being able to make a personal deductible contribution because previously it was, it was a bit harder to do that, but now essentially everybody could do it if, if they had the limit. So that's, that's a, a, a tip for, um, for this year. Um, so if you go to the concessional contribution catch up to the next one. So this started from 1st of July 18. It's for people with account balances or total super balances are less than 500,000. So when I to say total super balance, that's all your super in all the different funds that you have all added together has to be less than $500,000. Um, the 2020 is the first year that you can really use this. Um, and it has a, like a five year rolling limit. So if you go to the next slide, so I'll, I'll show you what I mean by the, the, the five years. So in this table, we've got James, who's 43, super balance of 350, so he's less than the $500,000. Um, so in the 2019 year, he only made 10 grand with the contributions. The limit, as before, was 25,000. That means he hasn't utilized $15,000 of the concessional contribution limit. Next year, in the 2020 year, he made a $15,000 contribution. Once again, not utilizing the contribution limit, so he's got 10 grand left over. So if you see on the down the side, you've got the maximum contribution the following year, that just keeps accumulating for every time you, you don't use the maximum with $25,000 limit. So potentially, if you keep on moving forward, if it goes to the 22, 23 financial year, he could potentially make a $90,000 deductible contribution to super without breaching any of the contribution limits and giving himself an extra tax bill. Come the 2020. Can I just add there, that's really powerful, particularly for um, primary producers that might mm. have farm management deposits or for sales that, that they've accumulated. And the way that the legislation previously worked, if you didn't put your 25 in, you, you lost it for that year. And exactly. in the good old days or the bad old days, whichever way you want, <laughs> but when you could put 100,000 in, you could really, you could take 100,000 out of a farm management deposit and really do some decent tax planning with it. Um, this allows people to do a catch up and, and bring some of that income in um, over and above the 25, which was the, which the old ruling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So when we, when we moved to the 23, 24 year, that $15,000 excess uh, available that he had in the 18, 19 year, that drops off. And then whatever he's short for the 2023, 20, 24 year then comes into it. So it's a five year rolling period. So the, the oldest unused limit drops off every five years. Um, so that's important to know, but it, it is a, it's quite a, a powerful tool that we can start using this financial year. Um, so with people with cash flow, I know cash flow is tight with the with businesses. So if they don't utilize the whole 25 grand this year as a deductible contribution, there may be opportunity next year if business picks up to have a greater tax deduction in the future years to, um, to claim. So I think that's really it for the concessional. Then now the COVID-19 early release. So there's been a bit of press about this. I'll just give you some quick stats if I can. So 1.3 million applications have been made, have been approved by the ATO. Um, two thirds of the applications have been for people who are 40 years and younger. Um, and that equates to about $11 billion being paid out of the superannuation industry at the moment. So that's a fair bit of, fair bit of money so far. Um, and there's probably more to come. So basically all the applications for this are made through the MyGov. So you have to sign up for it to, to be able to do the application. Um, it's for $10,000 for the 1920 year and then a further $10,000 for the 2021 financial year. Um, so the applications for the 20 for the 1920 year obviously end at 30 June. The applications for the 2021 year end on the 24th of September. 
2020. Um, the withdrawal is not taxed at all. You don't have to include it in your personal tax return. Um, it's tax-free money coming out of your super fund. Now, this all sounds very good, but we would suggest that you, you before you apply for it, seek advice in relation to it to see if you're eligible or if, it, if it's applicable to you. And the second bit is the timing of the application. So it counts in the financial year which the application is made, not when you actually receive the money. So if you make the application in June, but you don't get the money into July, it still counts as a June application. And you can still make a further one in the 2021 financial year. Um, what also, and also comes out of, if you have multiple super funds, because a lot of people have changed jobs, have could have three or four, five super funds. You can choose the $10,000 to come out of any of those five super funds or a combination of them. So you can sort of pick and choose which, which fund you want to take out of. And obviously if you don't have 10 grand in super, then you're limited to what your super balance is when you make the application. Um, but the other big um, issue with this is what the long-term impact is of taking this money out now, especially if, if, if you're younger. So some examples that I found, so if, if someone who's 25 years old takes the 20 grand out, so the two lots of the $10,000, they could uh, reduce their total super balance by the time they retire by seventy to one hundred thirty thousand dollars, depending on the earnings between now and then. If you're thirty-five, you could reduce your your retirement benefit by between forty-five and eighty thousand dollars, depending on earnings as well. So, before you apply for it, just have a think about if there's any other options or if there's you know, if it's right for you, because it does have a long-term impact. On your superannuation balance, um, which could mean in the future more people relying on their age pension than what I suppose the government is, a, is, is counting on at this point in time. Um, so the eligibility is pretty straightforward. So if you're unemployed, um, if you've been made redundant after 1st of January 2020, uh, fall in turnover of 20%, um, or if you're receiving any of the, the government benefits like job seeker, youth allowance, parenting payments, special benefits, and farm household allowance as well. Um, so it, it's it's one of those things that, yeah, it, it is good, but you just have to be mindful of the implications of taking it out. Sorry, I keep jumping ahead. My bad. No, no, no that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I'm trying to predict. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just doing trying, a good job. <laughs> you're trying to hire me along because you want to move on to the, to the next topic, so that's, that's fine. Um, <laughs> The other big change that the government announced is the reduction to the minimum pension for those who are receiving it, re receiving a pension. So what they've done is they've said um, they've halved what the minimum requirement is. Um, and this is very similar to what they did back when the global financial crisis was upon us. Um, they halved the minimum pension for a few years then they did it three quarters and they put it back up to the full pension. Now, um, so if someone is say, 67 they're receiving normally five percent of their pension account balance as a pension so what it means is basically now they receive two and a half percent as a minimum draw now and this applies to account-based pensions market linked and transition to retirement pensions it doesn't apply to defined benefit pensions that you get from like a, a public sector super fund that some people are still receiving now it's important for people who are on the on one of these pensions to pay the minimum pension each financial year um, if you don't do it, there's some significant tax implications for the super fund. Um, one of them is your pension effectively, if you don't meet the minimum, your pension effectively ceases from the 1st of July that financial year, which means the fund doesn't get the benefit of the tax-free income that you get if you're normally on a pension. So the fund money moves back into the accumulation account and then the whole fund's investment earnings could be taxable for that financial year. And then you have to potentially restart the pension um, in a future financial year if you want to continue to pay it. So that could have significant impact, especially if you've got capital gains during that financial year or significant income. Um, it can have quite the impact and I've, I've seen it for some of some people who have, who have missed out, unfortunately. Um, but if you're concerned about it, um, you know, talk to an advisor. Uh, we, can, we can certainly uh, help you with that and, and make sure you're on track. Um, the other big thing is that what you can do is um, and this is a strategy that um, 
we've, we've had in place from, from some of our clients is called a recontribution of the pension payment. So if you're eligible to make a contribution, you can take the money out of super and then put it back in as a potentially as a non-concessional contribution or a tax-free contribution. Um, that does a couple of things. One, it makes sure the, there's still cash inside the super fund, especially if you don't need the money outside of it. Um, the other thing is, it obviously, you can make it as a deductible contribution or, or an undeductible contribution, so it might be some tax benefits personally for you. Um, and it also has potentially some uh, estate planning benefits down the track by putting it in as a tax-free or non-concessional contribution as well. So that's something else to sort of think about as far as tax planning is concerned. And I think that is about it for me. So you are done. Well done. Oh, now, team, I'm conscious that we've run over time. I apologise. That is my lack of IT. We're going to keep rolling because product production is a really important topic. And Jeff is going to run us through that. Thank you, Sally. Saving the best to last. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, look, the, the the obvious one and the one that we that we use uh, fairly frequently is the deferred profit on four sales of, of livestock and dating back right to the start of, of the previous year between floods in North Queensland, droughts most of the eastern seaboard and, and then fires. Uh, I really don't see that there is going to be any concern by the ATO at all of, of for sales being used um, over, over the last 12, uh, well, really the last 24 months. So you've got the ability to defer that profit made on the sale of livestock as a result of those reasons. Um, it is a deferment. You've got the ability to bring that, that profit in over five years. You, have, you can also bring it in in equal instalments, or you've got the ability to offset against um, replacement livestock uh, the important thing is you must continue to be a primary producer while you've got those four sales. Uh, the moment that you cease primary production, they uh, are brought back into account. Uh, we have got on there that you need to be in a drought declared area. Um, we advise clients that um, specifically that doesn't need to technically uh, be the case, although I know a lot of the shires at the moment are still in a drought declaration um, and that hasn't been... Um, released but we always tell clients it's a good idea if you know that you're going to have sales that are likely to be forced to um, go and take a photo it might not be great uh, uh, to take a photo of the paddocks looking like they are but if you ever get asked and there is ever evidence that's required at least you've got something there to back up that that, that were the reason um, that the that the cattle were sold um, I, I as I said um, earlier in, in the broadcast, there is a, an ability, because most people over the last 12 months have, in, in last year's case, they've already taken some four sales out. Uh, the 18, 19 year hadn't been a, a good year for a lot of producers. Uh, interestingly, as opposed to say six or seven years ago, when there were a number of four sales due to drought, uh, cattle prices were well down. So, so uh, people were selling cattle and, and getting very little return. Interestingly, over the last 24 months, people have been forced selling cattle, but that cattle uh, price remained reasonably high. So we've got the double whammy of, of, of people getting out, but fortunately they've at least received uh, good money for, for the cattle. So there is a tax issue that we've got to deal with. Those people that have used forced sales in the 18, 19 year, with the ability, uh, with the accumulated depreciation or the, the um, clean out of, of depreciation pool balances, uh, there is an ability to bring that, uh, those four sales back in potentially in this 19, 20 year. So that's just something to, to talk to your advisor about. Uh, just the next, thanks Sally. Um, so going back to, to the deferral um, of, of the profit, in this example, we've got Tom selling 100 head of cattle for 100,000 um, due to drought conditions. If we say that these cattle were sold due to the drought, uh, the profit is able to be deferred. The profit is calculated based on what the sale of those cattle were, less the freight cartage commission, take away the, the uh, cost of those cattle, so the tax value. So if, if we had them on the books at 50,000, they were sold for 100, there would be a 50,000 profit and that's the component that gets deferred. Uh, thanks Sally. Now the farm management 
deposits. Um, they've, a few years ago, the, the government increased the, the limits up to 800,000, so, um, which, which has really been a great, uh, great thing for primary producers, and we've seen a number of, of people take advantage of that. Um, so provided primary producers are, are again, they're trading in their own name, a partner in a partnership or beneficiary of a trust are able to put these farm management deposits in. They need to be put in by the 30th of June. It needs to hit the bank account a little bit like David was talking about the, the contributions for super in most cases need to hit, hit the, um, the uh, account balance by that 30th of June. The same with these FMDs, they, they uh, must be in place. Uh, that's the big difference between the farm management deposits and the four sales. The four sales were able to do a little bit of, of, of work after the end of June when we're talking to clients, how, much, uh, how many of these were four sales, how much would you like to bring in or take out. Um, unfortunately, the farm management deposits, uh, although they're a, a great tool, you need to actually do the forward planning and have those in place by the 30th of June. Just remember as well that the non-primary production income needs to be less than 100,000. So often you'll have a, a partnership with, with mum and dad. Uh, Dad's full-time on, on, the, on the property. Uh, uh, mum might be a, a director of nursing at the, at the local hospital. She's on 110,000. No good placing farm management deposits for both of those because it, it just won't work. You'll get um, a deduction for, for dad, but not for mum. Uh, the... The, as, as David also said, with, the, with this change to the, um, uh, the banking, if you like, of, of superannuation that, that um, hadn't been claimed in previous years, it's a great opportunity to use these farm management deposits or clear them out by putting money into superannuation. And the other one too is if you do have a number of, of these farm management deposits um, that are sitting at the bank, say you've got 200,000, with this upfront 150,000, uh, instant deduction. Uh, now's a good opportunity to have a review and say, well, look, this could be the, the, the uh, opportunity we're looking for to clean out uh, those farm management deposits, bring them in as income, but not be hit with, with tax. The other thing about the farm management deposits, just quickly, just be careful that they don't go in a partnership name. They have to go in an individual's name. So uh, if, if you are op operating as mum, dad partnership, um, the bank will not accept a joint account for an FMD. So if you want to get the best result, it needs to be, uh, we'll speak to your advisor, but generally you would go 50-50. So if you want wanting to put 200,000 in as a tax deduction, it needs to be 100,000 mum and dad. Uh, that should be about equal to that. Um, we've got a quick example here. Sam's got a taxable income of 200,000, which is made up of 170 primary production and 30 non-primary production. If he puts the 100,000 into an FMD by the 30th of June um, for this, this year, his taxable income is reduced uh, to 100,000 for the 19-20 um, year. Unlike the four sales, which have got a five-year limit for you either to have to bring them back in or, or um, freshen them up, uh, the farm management deposits can stay outstanding as long as you are a primary producer or you pass away. So uh, don't do either of those things before getting rid of the um, your farm management deposit. And, and although I, I, I uh, slightly joke about the passing away, it is something that we really need to manage carefully because um, it's, it's a great tax deduction and it's easy to get those FMDs in, not quite as easy sometimes to, to um, negotiate and transition those farm management deposits out. Uh, next, thank you. Thanks, Sally. So um, now fencing, re really over the last few years, the tax office and the government have, have really provided some free kicks uh, for, for primary producers. There's not too many areas now that, that um, you're not getting an immediate 100% deduction for um, that say five, 10 years ago, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be getting. Um, so in the uh, fencing is, is a good one. Uh, previously, if there was a new line put in, um, that was a, a capital, considered a capital expense and, and not an immediate write-off. Um, now fencing, water improvements and uh, fodder storage uh, is all 100% uh, deduction in that year of purchase. There is no um, uh, issues in relation to, to uh, a limit on that. That's, uh, that's immediate. That water improvement um, 
is, is a great example. If you put a centre pivot in, if it cost $100,000 and you, you were able to equipment finance that, a, a great example of being able to get the tax deduction in, in that year and you haven't even paid for it. Now, depending on when the, um, uh, the, the finance uh, kicks in, it could be that you uh, you get that tax deduction and, and the first payment isn't until the following year. So um, uh, a really good uh, incentive that they've, that they've got. Just be careful um, with the fencing. It, not all fencing is equal. And so technically cattle yards do not meet that fencing definition. So um, that is one area that is, um, that is separate. The other one I would say as well is um, machinery sheds. There is a difference in the way the tax office treat uh, machinery sheds and fodder storage sheds. So it's the fodder storage that gets the full 100% tax deduction. The machinery still needs to be depreciated. Um, the, uh, you know, there was something that I was going to move on to there. No, missed it, Sally. So uh, wages for the family, don't forget it needs to be paid before the um, 30th of June. But under the um, single touch payroll, any family members are deemed to be closely held relatives and they don't need to be uh, included for the, for the STP. Um, I, I won't go into the, the single touch payroll, Sally, at, at this point, but I think most people would be aware that the ATO are, are really changing the way that um, uh, employers uh, report on, on, um, on their uh, employees. And it is an area that, that for a lot of uh, primary producers is going to mean a, a big change, particularly for those elderly primary producers that might only have um, people that, that come in on a, on a relatively casual basis every few months to help with mustering, to, to help with um, a little bit of fencing. They previously had been called contractors or they may have been um, paid under the old uh, group certificate pay-as-you-go summary where it was done at the end of the year. Unfortunately, with the ATO guidelines, basically everybody, including uh, those type of primary producers, needs to be on the single touch payroll. So we could do a whole session on that by itself, Sally, but we'll move on. The other one is the forward payment of expenses. So as usual, what we tell clients, if they know that they're going to have expenses uh, in the next couple of months, it's a good idea to bring forward those, uh, those costs. Um, if you know that you're going to do a new fence line, um, go to, go to uh, your particular um, outlet, buy, buy the wire, um, buy what's needed, the baling twine, fertiliser, fuel, etc. Bring that into, into that, this financial year. Uh, and then you've got the, the deferment of, of income for crops, whether that be so mung beans, have they, have they been graded? Cotton, uh, does it, has it been tagged and the, and the modules been ginned uh, by the 30th of June? Um, and obviously crops that are still in production or, or harvested and, and there are things that we can do with, with um, trading stock or stock on hand for that. But look, the, 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 um, the takeaway for, for me, Sally, for, for those primary producers is just to be aware of how this um, immediate write-off of uh, depreciation might affect things, in particular those that have already got farm management deposits on the books or they've got forced sales on the books because um, it, it can be um, for sales are okay. We can deal with those at the end of the 30, oh, in, when we're doing the tax um, in the, in the um, uh, foreseeable months, but farm management deposits, we need to do something before the 30th of June. So Jeff, you, everyone needs to come and see you. That's what we're saying. Do not leave it till after 30 June. Yeah, no. That, everyone that, got that? <laughs> Too late. <laughs> that's right. Thanks for that. All right, we've got our little summary of other ideas we've got and Kerry's going to quickly, because I know that we're conscious we're over time, I apologise again, we're going to quickly run through some other ideas before we say goodbye for today. Okay, thanks Sally. Um, we will be quick. Um, like Jeff just said, if you've got any expenses that can be brought forward, installed and ready for use, um, have a think about that and bring them into this year if you think this year is going to require the tax deduction more than next year. Um, during this time, a lot of us will have bad debts because people have fallen on hard times. So don't just leave them hanging on your books. If um, Do a genuine review of your debtors to see if there's any um, debtors that you can write off before 30th of June so that you're not paying tax on money you're not going to get anyway. Research and development that was touched on today 
if you, a lot of people are innovating now, so just be mindful. If, if you're creating something that hasn't, there's knowledge that's not been, um, that you can't get anywhere else and you're spending money to do that, keep track of it, please. Um, research and development gives you an additional 15% tax benefit and it's a refundable tax offset. So talk to your advisor about that. I urge you, there's so many people who do research and development and don't get the tax benefit out of that. Um, we've been through the asset purchases. Um, if you're going to buy something, don't just do things, buy things for tax purposes, but obviously your timing is everything with regard to the, the asset write-offs. If there's any donations that you wanted to make, get them in before end of year. That's a bit of a no brainer. Um, deductible super contributions, David's already covered that. So obviously we're not financial um, planners or advisors. So that's just general information. And if you, um, yeah, speak to your financial planner about that, but we've just told you the tax consequences today of that. Um, yeah. yeah so I just make one, a point about the contributions. So with the non-concessional, the tax-free contributions, you have to double check what your total super balance is before you make them or, or ask your advisor to have a look because if it's more than 1.6, you can't, you, you, you can't make the non-concessional contribution if, you, if your total super balance is more than 1.6. So it's important to look at what your balance was at 30 June 19 to decide if you can make what contributions you can make in the 2020 financial year. Thanks, David. Um, for individuals and small businesses, prepaying interest on investment loans um, up to 12 months ahead to get the deduction now. And Jeff touched on single touch payroll and taxable payments annual reports for those subcontractors in those industries who require it. Require it. So um, just Pick up the phone, give your tax advisor a call just to check that you've got everything in order well before. Don't don't call us on the 30th. It's the 30th. Uh, yes, it's a Tuesday. We don't want all the calls on on Tuesday the 30th. So, and, thank and, you. and not this afternoon either. Is that right? Are we all in agreement? <laughs> no, this is true. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Sally. Well, guys, I know I had a bit of a hiccup to start with, um, but I want to thank everybody for dialing in. And those who, who hung around, um, thank you for sticking through. You'll all get a copy of this video um, as, well, as well as the slides. And I certainly hope you make the time to make an appointment with your more Stevens uh -huh. advisor to talk about your personal <laughs> circumstances. Thank you so much. And everyone say goodbye. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you.